welcome back to uh, another what can we call it um, again just I have the time and space and God speaks to my heart every day something fresh but I will say my last video uh, message was an introduction to understanding how we can approach our freedom through the cross, our own freedom. More about the principles of that, the understanding of that. I pondered how many things, because it was an introduction, how many things I could have said. I think one central thing, it's like a principle, will, will remain in, is that the cross was to was made available for us to be free from the power of the flesh. There's a lovely verse in Romans which is twofold. It says, He died for our sin, but rose for our justification. That's a very interesting distinction the writer leaves us with. Jesus died for our sin, but he rose again for our justification. It's, it's twofold. I'll leave this thing with you <coughs> to say that his dying provided a way whereby we may uh, be free through the power of the cross. That was just, anyway, concluding my last message. This message, which I better tell you the title of, I'll, I'll say it first. This message is more to do with the operation of authority and power, which does include our own deliverance, because we were talking about deliverance through the cross, but it's more to do with advancing the kingdom, looking out upon operating, and I better tell you the title. This is... God, I give you my authority. Now, I've realized as I was penning this throughout the day that I'm not going to try and answer or, or just point and push out the answers <coughs> as preachers do. It, it's as though you needn't be in the room. They're going to give you the answers. I'm trying to lay out before us a table and it's more a table of questions almost and it's more a, a, a table that begs our questioning of God <coughs> when he says effectively I give you my authority and uh, you can say what verse is that well Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is mine, I give, go therefore. So <coughs> you could argue, there's not a verse that says, I give you my authority, but every, uh, every connection, can, uh, you know, every content of the whole thrust is that God gives us authority, his authority. I give you my authority. Now this is God, I hope, as you can he hear it, presenting that to you I'm not going to present the answers there's the question as we sit with God uh, I give you my authority the next little thing I wrote is nothing shall be impossible for you not for God for you this is taken out of the verse which I might get to read some stuff around it but the Matthew 17 20 because of a situation I might read to you, the disciples asked why they couldn't cast a demon out. And I might read the whole story of the account because it's good food. And Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So, <clears throat> I just want to leave you again and again this statement from God. I give you my authority. Because I have needs. All around us has great needs. And uh, 
as we unpack this, you will see that it isn't that straightforward. And I ask various questions. Uh, let's another question: To whom is this authority given? I give you my authority, says God. I think again. I am hoping you will answer those questions and ponder those questions. Certainly, it's to believers. It's to believers called as his children, and I would add, kind of, to his children whom he has called out of the world, followers of Jesus, who comprehend and have taken on board that their calling is to extend the kingdom of God. And another phrase, living out the expression of God for his glory. So we want to be operating in his authority, not just to get things done, but because it's the truth. And it expresses who we are. Now God has made us his sons and daughters. So it's an expression of the truth to bring him glory when we live out and express that authority and extends the kingdom and and sets people free and all sorts of lovely things. Uh, I, I like this question because it's the other question. The next question will help you to see. <coughs> well, it, again, it's for us to answer together. Is it God's will to heal me? And uh, the world around us might say, and the theologian theological debates. Is it God's will to heal? Heal me. <laughs> and the next question will help you see something, I think. Is it God's will that disease slowly creeps upon your body and then kills you? Because funny enough, there are a lot of people who, who stay with that first question and uh, give that as a reason. Um, they give it a reason in answer to the next statement. How come we do not see en masse evidence worldwide of this bestowed authority of God given to believers? And you see how it fits in with that other question, whatever it was. Is it God's will to heal? Is it God's will that disease slowly creeps on your body and kills you? I hope you will enter into that process because I come to uh, various questions <laughs> that that will be important. You know, who cares, you could say, as long as I'm all right. <laughs> How come we don't see it en masse? Now, I've got two accounts there. When's a good time to chuck it in? Uh, we'll, we'll go on and then come back to those uh, passages because they are good food. Again, I'm posing questions because the answer that you get and we get prayerfully from God will establish us in a forward motion going somewhere. Is it true and factual, even in recent history, that individuals have broken through into another level of healing ministry and I don't know whether you know it but I certainly do there have been recent his in uh, in recent history there have been personalities or you know wrong word people believers ministers who have broken through and seen a huge measure of healing explode from their lives and I'm posing that and just laying that before you because we're trying to offer you, us, the, the opportunity to stretch ourselves. I give you my authority, God says. And if this is true, that there is evidence in recent history, certain individuals broke through into another level of, it, of moving in this stuff, why can't we? Why don't we? If it's true and factual. And it is true, in fact. Is there a cost to operating in this authority that God has given us? And I've, I said it earlier, why bother to seek to operate in that authority? Is there a cost? Yes, there is a cost. Because you could say, why bother? As long as I'm all right. 
It's a free gift, but wrestling through deters the majority from breaking through into a level of moving in this stuff. There are theological opposition and arguments that make it all too much work to rise up and operate in what I say, and God is saying, I give you my authority. There are theological opposition, establish arguments that deter the majority from even asking. Again, I'm saying these are all questions. I've got just questions, questions. Is there a lawful opposition to operating in this authority? Lawful. And I, I, I asked myself earlier reading these, what on earth did I mean this morning when I was writing that? Is there lawful opposition? And I've put now, to help me understand what I meant, blockages. If someone comes and there are issues that they need to deal with, God is asking them to deal with, and they are stuck there, we won't say they're resisting or rebelling. We'll say they're stuck there and need help to break through. Then that can be an opposition to operating in authority, that you want to see them healed and there are stuff that they need to deal with and needs to be sorted. Maybe the two uh, stories from the Bible I come back to will help us see that. Is there an unlawful opposition in operating to this authority? And I've said, yes, there is spiritual opposition. Not just from somebody who, as the story goes, they were trying, a, a man wanted his son delivered from a demon and the disciples couldn't. And there was not just the opposition of uh, the, the demon in a person, as you're trying to minister, but the opposition around that to keep you from even going near that ministry with the theological arguments and the reasonings why, you know, it's not for today, it, it's past, or the other one, what was the other one? Is it God's will he to heal today? Is it God's will to heal me? Is it God's will that <laughs> disease creeps on my body and kills me? I think you can answer that second one. Is it God's will? And if you answer that second question with, of course it's not God's will that disease creeps on my body and destroys me, then maybe you should side with the other one. Is it God's will to hear? Uh, and conclusively from the gospel, Jesus died to deliver us. So there's a huge part of the gospel, like the central theme of the entire Bible and Jesus coming, was to deliver us and set us free. And uh, mm -hmm, I'm posing the questions. Uh, consider authority in the Old Testament, and I was thinking of Moses, but you could include them, all of them. Authority operating in the Old Testament. Remember, Moses is a good example, which is good and bad. Moses had a rod. At one time, he he uh, was exasperated and struck a rock in the power of his flesh, you could say, and God actually severely, <laughs> he paid for that very dearly, if you want to go back and read that story, because God said, you didn't honor me before the people. To honor God before the people in that story, in the case of Moses, was to make sure they knew that it was God and the glory went to God. But when Moses struck out, it was frustration, it was whatever, and he paid dearly. But, but aside from adding the story, I just wanted to say one thing sticks out to me in operating in the authority of the Old Testament, and it was the word responsibility. And, and I've said in the New Testament, believers tend to be saying it is more an operation in the realm of the Spirit, and I would tend to agree that it is first authority in the spirit realm and of faith. But I then conclude it's a responsibility. So God says, I give you my authority. And there, there is a costliness, there's a responsibility, there's a walking in that. And uh, again, I'm posing all the questions. It's not very fair, but I hope it's edifying. I've to consider cost, 
opposition, conditions, and I, I mean that all inclusively. In the case of someone we're ministering to, the conditions of them dealing with blockages, conditions for us operating in authority, again, I pose the question, is God requiring us to walk circumspectly so that we might authority, uh, operate in that authority? And often, because I add this later, does he freeze the assets? Because the gifts operate even though there is want, lack, in the vessel being used. So, back to that other conditions, the, there's not such a big condition on us walking circumspectly. We must, and we don't have boldness and confidence if we're walking contrary to God. But there is a, a historical accounts of those great big ministers where they were flawed, uh, dreadfully so in some cases, uh, yeah, as, as the years went by, and yet the gift was operating. And that's an interesting thing. I didn't want to bring too much on that. But that's almost a side, because the fact that God has given us his authority is not just about giftings. Whereas the gift of healing and miracles is a gift of healing and miracles. But the authority is more to do with us walking in life, representatives of the kingdom, ambassadors of God Almighty, and seeking to have a heart that's looking outward to bring that authority to deliver and set free. And behind overshadowing this entire message about I give you my authority, which also excites me, is it's not just about a demon in a person or an oppression around or something. If God has given us his authority and we're called to be intercessors and praying people and prophets to declare and decree his word, then that authority has, that you good old-fashioned word, a lot of clout in our prayer, intercession and prophecy. And that's extending into the heart of prayer and intercession because I'm leaving that for the other channel on intercession but certainly you see this authority is probably more prevalent in my thinking in the realm of prayer uh, and you know so there you go there you go but back to that uh Cost, opposition, conditions, principles, and uh, lots of principal things. Uh, one principle springs to mind of this given authority is that it is never carnal or soulish opera operation, and it's never hype. You can rela relax. You do not have to hype the power of God being released through authority. It's an orchestration. It's an overflow of the Spirit of God. There's a beautiful verse in uh, Ezekiel. It says that there is a river f coming out of the sanctuary, the temple, of this visionary picture that Ezekiel was prophetically laying out in his writing as he saw the tabernacle, the temple of God, and all, all sorts of profound, wild and deep things, as they were set in order out of the threshold came a river of life. And this extending of the kingdom, this operation of the authority, is an orchestration, it's an overflow of the river of God. So our quest is to be sensitively moved and living in the river. It's all about, I talked about on another channel, the activities of the Holy Spirit. Three, uh, in, that's in the book of Corinthians. Uh, diversities of gifts, uh, activities, and I forgot the other one. Very interesting study. So it's an overflow. Uh, we are to be led by the Spirit. Uh, unless that becomes an excuse of written, uh, led by the Spirit, so you never do anything. I haven't been led by the Spirit. 
Maybe you're just not uh, doing it because of something else. Maybe he's seeking to lead you. And uh, again, questions. Uh, so, I give you my authority. And I want to be that prayer for release from God to you and to me. More principles I scribbled down and I, then we might go back to those passages. Principles, again, of operation. From that little verse, although we might read that again, you must say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. You must say to the, as we will read in the story, what Jesus said to the situation. We must understand, comprehend. The disciples couldn't do it. Therefore, the child would have remained imprisoned and oppressed. And I've said this is a truth of understanding to consider. The child, that we're going to read the story, would have remained oppressed and the demon would have remained if they hadn't in or, you know, brought the situation to Jesus. The disciples couldn't do it. So understand that as a principle. There's people out there oppressed who, if somebody doesn't come along, they will remain oppressed. People don't like that. They want to say the sovereign will of God <laughs> is what it is. And that's a twist of his sovereignty. But that's another stuff. Again, this is all healthy challenge. Confidence. If I know that I know that I know I could remove oppression from my own life or anyone else, it would make a big difference. Confidence. If I knew that I knew. These things are they're kind of questions. They're kind of things that you just... I hope there are, it's a table laid out. And we, I will listen to this again in the future and again when I've finished. And just hold it before God. Look into the promise from God who says, I give you my authority. And uh, now we'll read these. Uh, Mark 9, 17 to 27. And it's in other Gospels, but this one has a good take of understanding. Uh, stuff that the other Gospel writers didn't include. So <coughs> I'll read it quick, because a lot of it. One of the crowd answers said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. I sometimes used to wonder, is he just chucking that out? Why? Because you brought him to dis the disciples. You, your faith, didn't believe they could do it. And that's one take. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it in the normal context is... Uh, the disciples couldn't, so Jesus sorted it out, and he was saying that to the, the disciples mainly, the thrust of it, you faithless per, uh, generation. Then they brought him to him, the child to Jesus, and when he saw him, the spirit saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth. So Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from the childhood, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into war to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people come running, he rebuked the unseen spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and he came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And I, I read it quick, but... The, you can listen again or read that yourself, Mark 9, 17 to 27. 
Uh, there are loads of interesting things. I think when Jesus hurriedly cast it out because the crowds were gathering and he didn't want a big show, he just kicked it out quick. That's why, lots of observations. Then we read that verse. The disciples asked, why couldn't we do it? Jesus said, because of unbelief. For I say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, that's a very important factor. I give you my authority. How much faith do I need? The tiniest true faith, understanding that I know, that I know, that I know. And that will work, Jesus said. And, and I'll read another account and then I'll just wrap this up with something. I include another account of a young girl delivered from demons. Mark 7:28. A mother comes desperate for her daughter who was dreadfully tormented. She kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus poses a test for her heart. And Jesus said, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. This woman, mother, answered and said to him, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then Jesus said to her, For this saying, Go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Before I wrap it up, I'll just point to something there. The girl didn't need to be present for the operation of command, which is bringing in the prayer uh, authority. I give you my authority. The child with a demon problem wasn't even present. And I wrap this up with two accounts. There's a father reduced to tears. There's humility there. There's, there's a heart test again. The woman, there is a heart test. There's a mother whose heart is tested with a statement that looks to our modern language like an insult. It's not right to give the, the children's bread to dogs. And she overcame that. She didn't even notice the, uh, what we would say is uh, the rudeness. It wasn't rude. We don't fully understand it. But it, was, it has significance uh, because she was maybe a non-Jew or something. But it was still uh, not the sweetest thing one could say to a mother, desperate. But she overcame the test of her heart. The father overcame the test of the heart. The mother overcame a test of heart. And I've wrapped this up by saying a father and a mother, there is a restoration principle. And that's the last verse of the Old Testament says, I will send you Elijah. And that's more an anointing than individuals. Jesus referred to John the Baptist as Elijah has already come. So John the Baptist was a type of Elijah, but it's an anointing. I believe the end time is going to see the spirit of Elijah come upon maybe multitudes rather than individuals. But the spirit of Elijah, the anointing of Elijah is going to come into the earth and operate because it's about restoration of the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of children to the fathers. And this, uh, the backdrop to these two stories of uh, the authority of God being operating, operating was there was a, a, a coming together of that promise of the spirit and anointing of Elijah to bring restoration relationships restoration and people who sometimes we talk about the conditions and blockages if people have uh, oppression sometimes they need to be dealing with the roots of relationships that are broken down hostility to fathers and mothers even if they're no longer alive one still has to be able to say in God's presence father I now forgive them even if they're not alive it's not for them it's so that our hearts can become free channels of the overflow of the river of God so consider that but there's a lovely principle about the fathers and mothers and restoration but those two stories and in the middle of it, then I jump to Matthew's Gospel, where the wording is different again. Matthew 17, 20, and we read that verse. The disciples said, asked why, and Jesus said, because of your unbelief, 
if you just say with a mustard seed faith move mountain it shall obey you and many people like to quote the verse in uh, Corinthians as an excuse why not to operate in the miraculous without love brother if I can't oh, if I can move mountains but have not love I'm nothing yeah but let's move some mountains please come on and get love get love fill our hearts i think it would be very nice and loving to move some people's mountains of oppression don't you so let's move mountains and have love and so i leave you this unusual message um, it's not really uh, directly linked to the message on deliverance through the cross which i must give some meat to one day but it certainly all fits together and touches the heart of intercession and prayer. And it really is a table of questions with the promise behind us coming from God our Father. I give you my authority. Let's see God's authority released. Let's see the captives freed. Let our bodies know healing, covenant healing promises of God every promise of God is yes and we say amen to the glory of God every promise of God that's a scripture a promise every promise God made is yes in Jesus Christ whom we are in and we say the amen we've got to come together with an amen faith understanding authority to get some of this stuff but may God be pleased to give us me as I listen to this and you as you listen to it may he be pleased to just bless our socks off give us healing for our own lives but give us a confidence and an expectation to give this away I give you my authority now let's go and extend the kingdom for God's great name for the freedom and liberty of people around us. Amen.